Why? Well, um, okay, let me preach. First Peter chapter 1. All right. Tell your neighbor, is the preaching, no? The QFC preaching. Oh, say the QFC preaching. The QFC preaching. All right. Receiving the end of your faith, even, I'm in chapter 1 of the book now. I'm going to run through chapter 1, chapter 2, and then I'll move to, I think, chapter... Let me just tell you and then so you can follow. All right. Follow in your book. That's why we give you the books, okay? And bring it every time you are coming to any church activity, even if it's a party, bring it. We'll talk about it. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to do chapter 1, go over chapter 2 again, which you did last week, and then I'm going to skip to chapter 8 or message 8. Amen. Amen. All right. So First Peter, receiving the end of your faith, even the what? The salvation of your souls, of which salvation prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that shall come into you, unto you, searching what and of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Glory to God. All right, go back to verse 9. The Bible says that receiving the end of your what? Faith, even the salvation of your soul. Amen. When all is said and done, salvation is the most important thing. The end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. What is the point in coming to church all these years? What is the point in giving offering? What is the point in paying tithe? What is the point in trying to be a good person in life when at the end of it all you don't get saved and you get left behind? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why you must be careful. You know, when you go out with you, hear all these things. Oh, why do I need Christ? Why do I need to say the sinner's prayer? I'm a good person. I don't curse. I don't drink. I don't fornicate, I don't steal, I haven't murdered anybody, I give to charity, I give donations, I go volunteering. All that is good. You are a moralist, not a Christian. Amen. Are you there? There is a difference. Tell your neighbor there is a difference. Are you there? So the end of your faith in everything that you believe in this world, it should lead you to the salvation of your soul. Amen. Then look at the next verse. All right, the next verse, please. And it says that now this salvation that I'm talking to you about, it says that prophets have inquired and searched diligently into it. Amen. And then where's the other verse? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Are you there? Glory to God. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How will you escape hell if you neglect your salvation? Oh, I I wanted to also say, those of us that are saved, all right, I believe everybody here is saved, all right, try, listen, you are the gateway for salvation, especially for the rest of your family members that are not saved. Are you there? I heard the Spirit tell me that some of you, we can bring Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, uh, Bishop Doug, Reverend Alex, Reverend Peter, they will not believe. But when they see you, their big brother they've been looking up to, when you go and say, Charlie, look, I've been young, I've been old, I'm now serving God, born again, they will listen to you. Are you there? Yeah, this is the word of the Lord. So start. Everything starts in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is your immediate surrounding. Are you there? Yeah. I say you are. There's a reason why God saved only you in your family. There's a reason why Joseph escaped to save his whole family and his whole tribe and his whole nation. Did you realize that? Yeah. So you also, you are the Joseph in your family. Are you there? Yeah. Stop depending on somebody else to save your family members. All right, so let's all rise up, including myself, and let's begin to speak to our family members, cousins, parents, even, who are not born again. Amen. Amen. 
Are you listening to me? Yeah. I think I was sharing with the shepherds or some people some time ago that I was privileged when my father came for my wedding anniversary last year. I spoke to him about Christ. Told him, you have to give your life to God now. Yeah, I spoke to him. He said, oh, okay, fine. When I, when I get to Ghana, I said, hey, the plane you are going to sit. I don't even know if it will make it to Ghana. He said, now, now. But by the grace of God, he did. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I texted everybody I know. All right, so if I didn't text you, it means I didn't know you. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, but seriously, I heard it when we were praying. God says, you are the gateway for salvation for your family. Amen. And I'm saying some of you, especially some of you who are like big brothers or people look up to you. Do you get it? They look up to you. You send them money, whatever. It's like everything you do, you tell them, hey, go, go and check my house for me. Hey, go and do this. Go and do this. I'll say, yeah. The same way you send them, tell them, look, give your life to Christ. They will give their life to Christ. Amen. Are you there? All right. So how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, you cannot escape. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. And then the previous verse we were reading in First Peter, it says, prophets have inquired. All right. Oh, let's go back. All right. No, go back. How shall we escape? 2, 3. Hebrews 2, 3. At which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Is there a next verse? Oh. Sister, you want me to go and bring Reverend Kobe? <laughs> God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders. And miracles and the gift of that. Where is, wait, go back to First Peter. Where is the one that says, look into? Did we miss it? Verse 12 of First Peter, okay. Hallelujah. Verse 12, please. Hey. Please, somebody should call Reverend Kobe for me. <laughs> All right. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto they that minister the things, which are now reported unto them, preach gospel, all of that. Are you sure? All right, great. Then look here. All right. Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. So I was telling them on Wednesday that, listen, you and I, we are not wise. Prophets have inquired into our salvation. Even angels who are like higher than us in a certain sense, they are also desiring to look into salvation. Then you that the thing was made for, you are not interested in salvation. There's something wrong. Can you agree? Prophets are inquiring, what is this salvation? Angels are also looking into it. What is this salvation? Then you that the thing was made for, you have no interest in salvation. There's something wrong. And have you realized that people who don't look into things, they are the ones who usually don't prosper. Yeah. Even as we're talking about these Thailand um, people, boys that have been um, caught in the cave. Who are the people who are rescuing them? Americans and British divers. Meanwhile, they have, uh, what do they call it, Thailandese or what? Thai, Thai divers. Do you get it? But they are not experienced. Because you and I, where we come from, we don't look into things. We are not interested. All we want is somebody to give us money. Do you understand? Yeah. Amen. Isn't it? Yeah. Some of you, as you've been here, your cousin back home for 10 years now never bothered to go and look into finding a job. As long as my brother in America is sending me money. What is my wahala? Let me just say that every day I'll just call you at the end of the month. I need. Bruh. 
<laughs> How are you? <laughs> How are the children? Oh, I've been praying for you guys. Pa. Me, I've been praying. God so bless you. Anyway, <laughs> did you send the Western Union? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. If all our governments had looked into how we can make roads, we would have had roads in Africa. Yeah. And recently, God even showed our bishop and he told our government in Ghana that, look, why don't we invest? We are waiting for asphalt road. This thing too is too expensive. Why don't we invest in concrete roads? Then he gave an example. When we got independence, Kwame Nkrumah, our first president, did a concrete road at Temamoto Way. More than 20 years now, it has hardly been renovated and it's still there. But we have been renovating this asphalt road and asphalt road. So as for the concrete, there, yeah, we have plenty. So why wait for asphalt we have to import? Let's just make concrete roads. Yeah, when he said it, they insulted him. They laughed at him. They said, white man, go to your country. <laughs> we are waiting for a loan. Yeah. Then another government came. Then he said it again. And they decided to look into it partially. Then they came to make a public statement that, wow. In fact, we looked into it and we realized that it is cheaper to make concrete roads and it actually lasts longer. But after now, that's why I said partially. They came to make that statement. After today, they haven't even done one inch of the concrete road. <laughs> yeah. So I'm saying all this to show that people don't prosper because they don't look into things. Yeah. You are not into things. Are you understanding? Yeah. And when you are a Christian and you are not into things, you will also not do well. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. Tell your neighbor, from today, I am into things. Yeah. That is what has made the Western world prosper. They are into things. They are into technology. They are into factories. They are into manufacturing. They are into space and other things. We are, we are not into anything. Yeah. We are into corruption and corruption and corruption. That one we are very good at. Wow. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you look into this great salvation, one of the things that you will soon realize is that it is a great act of love that God is showing towards you and I. Amen. And unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of people, I've been, tell your neighbor, he's been a pastor for a while. And I've seen one or two things, you know. Uh, I've been around. I've, I've had some things, you know. So I know one or two things. Are you understanding what I'm saying? All right. Tell your neighbor, is the preaching? No, is the preaching? No. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Listen, what I have seen, even me as a pastor, you see that a lot of people don't know how to respond to things, especially love. Yeah. When somebody loves someone, the recipient usually doesn't know how to respond. Yeah. Especially a lot of Ghana girls and boys. When I say Ghana boys, I mean, I mean Africans. So I don't know why the other countries are so happy. <laughs> All right. All right, let me clarify it. Especially African guests. <laughs> yeah. You tell an African guy, I love you, they will either laugh and say, like, Are you sure? Or they'll say, No. <laughs> they don't know how to respond to love. <laughs> yeah. When you tell an African girl, baby, I love you. <laughs> they will either laugh. They will say, what do you want? They will say, are you sure? Or they will do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brightest, true or not true? Yeah. <laughs> and so... Hello? <laughs> and so, in the same way, when God loves us, we don't know how to respond. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. But God has shown his great love for us. So much so that sometimes the angels are upset. Yeah. So one day they even ask God a question, who is man? Who is man that you are so mindful of? We have been here with you. Uh, we haven't disobeyed you. Whatever, this man, every day they are cursing you. They are disobeying you. How many times have you flooded the earth? You've killed all of them. This, that. Yes, still they don't love you. But you keep loving them. Yeah. So you see that we don't know how to respond to the great love of God. Now, what are one of the ways that we can respond to this great love that God has shown us? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Somebody is being blessed. When God has shown you his great love, this is one of the ways to respond. It says, but watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to announce to you that we have all been given a ministry. It's not only a pastor that has a ministry. You have a ministry as a Christian. And Paul is telling his son, his beloved son, Timothy, that... The only way or one of the main ways to make full proof of your ministry is to do the work of an evangelist. We are not saying become an evangelist. You can do the work of an evangelist. Amen. Amen. Are you there? Many of us, we have done the work of so many professionals, but you are not. Like, for instance, many mothers are not professional nurses or doctors, but don't they do the work of nurses and doctors at home? Oh, yeah. But they've never been to one, one day of even medical school. But at home, when their child is sick, they know how to give first aid, whatever. They, they are doing the work of a nurse. They are doing the work of a doctor. But they, 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 they are not. So you also, we are not, if you want to become an evangelist, that's great. It's, it's a whole office. But in your capacity, as an ordinary church member, not to say that in a derogatory way, all right, or whatever type of Christian you are, you can do a little bit work of an evangelist. Amen. Are you there? Huh? Yeah. Many of us older siblings, you have done the work of a parent from age 12, 13, 14, whatever. You were taking care of your younger siblings. Yeah. Meanwhile, you never, you've not even had a boyfriend before. Huh? Yeah. But at that age, you did the work of a mother. You get it? So you can also... As a nurse, as a housewife, whatever you are, sales, whatever profession you are in, you can add the work of an evangelist to your busy schedule. Amen. Oh, give the Lord a mighty clap of All right. And um, those of you who follow, maybe we'll let our drama stars also ask that those of you who follow First Love, you know, they did another wonderful play today about heaven and hell, judgment. Yeah, when you get to heaven, it's like your works. You'll be judged on your works, your ministry. What are your works? Your ministry that God gave you. Yeah, so when you get to heaven, one of the pages that will be open. All right, there's that, that. Okay, let's see what evangelistic work you did. Then we'll see. It's like you're going to write an exam. Answer section A, compulsory, then you didn't do. I mean, wow. Are you understanding? Then give me um, 1 Corinthians, um, what was the other verse? Those of you came on Wednesday. Give me 1 Corinthians, no, Colossians 4.17. Colossians 4.17. Somebody is being blessed. My God, I feel a blessing in here. Listen, say to Archippus, Take heed. Hey. I think the screen is saying I'm shouting too much. Okay. I'm sorry, screen. <laughs> Say to Archippus. <laughs> Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. And do what? That thou fulfill it. I'm trying to show you that you have a ministry. Are you there? Yeah. 
And it's not, you see, sometimes when you come to the church, we have singing ministry, ushering ministry. So it's like, in your mind, you don't see, you, as I keep saying, you cannot comprehend what this is. I don't have any ministry. I'm not in any singing group. I'm not in anything. I'm, I just come and go. And we are not talking about church ministry. You, as a person. He said he was talking to a person, not a church. He said, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord. The minute you gave your life to Christ, you received a ministry. The minute you joined the church, you, be, you received a ministry. All right? And yours is to fulfill it. Make sure you fulfill your ministry. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, one day I, I, I told a story. I don't know if you understand it, but one day... Bishop was traveling. You no, know, he travels around a lot because of his job. It's his job. It's not that he's on vacation or he just likes traveling. It's his job as the founder and overseer of the church. So he's going here, starting churches, training people, having camps. And there was one of our bishops. He just liked to travel with Bishop. So on one such occasion, as Bishop was traveling, he called and said, Oh, Bishop, I hear you're going to so so and so. Powerful. I've booked my flight, whatever. I'll meet you there. Then he said to his surprise, because he always travels with Bishop, and Bishop never says anything. But this particular time, Bishop told him, oh, it's powerful. You can come. But I want you to know that as I am going around, I am actually working. Do you understand? You see me going around, going around. I am working. You, as you are coming, I, I don't know why you are coming, but I just want you to know that I am not on vacation. I am at working. I am fulfilling my ministry. So you, as you are following me, you are just enjoying. You are not fulfilling your ministry. And that's what happens to a lot of us Christians. It's like, oh, me, I'm just chilling. Do you get it? No. Me, as you see me, as I'm preaching, as I'm organizing things, as I'm forming things, as I'm creating things, as I'm going outreach, as I'm visiting, as I'm calling, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> I'm fulfilling my ministry. I know what God has called me to do. I know what I'm supposed to do. But you, as you sit and you watch me, and I don't know if you are fulfilling your ministry, or as you always want to come with me, I don't know if you are fulfilling your ministry, but me, I am working. Amen. Amen. Ask your neighbor, are you working? All right, so everybody here, you have a ministry, and God wants you to fulfill it. So one of the ways to respond to God's great love for you, huh? Are you listening to me? It's to do the work of an evangelist. What is the work of an evangelist? To win souls. To talk to people about Christ. Are you there? Yeah. Win souls. Talk to people about Christ. Bring them to church. Pray for them. Amen. That is the work of an evangelist. Hallelujah. And in the Bible, you see that anybody who did such a work, God gave a title to them which was good, good shepherd. Who did God describe as a good shepherd? The one who went after the lost sheep. Good woman. Who did God describe as a good woman in Luke 15? The one who went, left her, her whatever and went to look for her one lost coin, her quarter that she lost. She left all the rest. Yeah. So anyone who is interested in the lost, uh, good is assigned to your name. Amen. Are you there? Because, you know, there are some people, they are not interested. It's like, as long as I am well, I'm okay. I don't care. I'm okay. The hell with everybody else. No. Hallelujah. May God help us. All right. So now, in John 3, 16, it's the famous verse we all know, isn't it? What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then I love verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, a lot of people think that God sent Jesus to come and condemn us. No, God is right here. God did not send his son into the world to come and condemn us, but rather that through his son, you and I and everybody else should be saved. Yes. Amen. Yes. Are you understanding the verse? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Huh? I have a feeling that you're not understanding the message. 
Romans 5, 6 to 10. Tell your neighbor we read in Romans chapter 5. What? I keep telling you, if you can't speak like me, it's okay. One day you get it. One day you get it. Just keep practicing. Glory to God. <laughs> For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, uh, for a righteous man will one die. Yet per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But I love the next verse. Oh. But God commended his love towards us in that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, you see how far you are from God? You, when you love somebody, you tell them, when you change, then come, I'll love you. But Bible says no. Whilst we were yet sinners, God said, ah, I like this one. Yeah, and the angels will say, hey, that is the one I like. Yeah. But you, you say, look, change, when you change, this is my number. <laughs> you call me when you have changed, and I'll come and marry you. No. Hallelujah. Are you there? But some of you, look, don't get this message twisted. Don't go and tell about, look, pastor said, take me as I am. So, <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, when they come and tell you, tell them, didn't you hear the pastor say, it says, God. <laughs> but God commanded, he didn't save me. <laughs> All right, you didn't get a joke. Let's move on. <laughs> Verse 9. <laughs> you are too slow. Father, give them um, quick understanding. Quick understanding. <laughs> you are too slow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Receive quick understanding. That's why having me promoted at work. Ah, when they speak, you are still standing there. <laughs> Look, you have to stop this, your African behavior. You take everywhere. When we have had a meeting, board meeting, go and implement, and you see, you are sitting there, you are still smiling. <laughs> then when your boss, you ask, what did the guy say? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> One day, a certain brider, uh, I think he was either from Cameroon or Liberia. Um, <laughs> he was coming to America for the first time, you know, and then as he sat on the plane, he sat by this, you know, posh person, and um, as the air hostess will come and ask, oh, everything okay, do you want anything? Then the guy would say, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm okay. So he was like, okay, he was watching. So when they got to him also, said, you want anything? I'm fine, I'm okay. After two hours, like, hey, the people, they are not bringing the food. <laughs> so he turned to another fellow African and said, ah, and he spoke in the local language that Charlie, the people came to ask me what I want. I said, I'm, I want, I'm fine. I want, I'm okay. I've been sitting here, they have not brought the food. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Don't follow someone. <laughs> Are you understanding the message? <laughs> All right. So God's love for us is so great. Yeah. That whilst we were yet sinners, yeah, he still loved us. Amen. So let's look at an analysis of this John 3.16. Are you listening to me? Number one, I'm going to just rush through them because we are way over time, and I don't even see it. Where is it? All right, number one, God has a special, no, this is not it, my God. Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
There we go. Number one, God is the greatest person ever, and he loves the whole world. Go back to John 3, chapter 16. For God so loved the world. Amen. For God so loved what? The world. How many of you believe that God is greater than anybody? Yeah, he's greater. He's the greatest. So if a great person does something, uh, it makes that thing what? Great, isn't it? Yeah. So God, a first analysis of this verse is that God is the greatest person ever who has ever loved the whole world. None before him, none next to him, and none after him. Amen. Amen. Number two, told you I'm rushing through. God shows the greatest love ever. That's what I just explained. Are you there? Yeah. If I'm a great person and I invent a car, automatically that car becomes the greatest car ever. Just because I'm a great person. So God also deciding to love us, Erica, is the greatest love anyone can ever receive. And you know why it's such a great love? Because for many of us, the truth is that, let's be, tell your neighbor, let's be real. No one here loves the whole world. At best, you love one, two, three, a few people. Yeah. Are you them? Especially women. Most women, they just love their children and their husband. They start, first they love their husband. Then after they start having children, then they start loving their children and their husband. The more children they have, the more the husband gets pushed back. Are you understand? That's why when you're a man and you're wise, you, you see some men, maybe I love to, I want to have a lot of, you keep having plenty of children. You see how your, your love, your wife's love for you will be pushed back and back and back and back. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah. And it's, it's no fault of yours. Our sinful nature, you can only love one or two people, okay. no matter how hard you try. Right. Are you there? Yeah. But God, he looked at all eight billion of us, said, I love them all the same, whether they are black, white, short, tall, educated, uneducated, whether they can give offering in church or not, whether they can pay tithe, whether, oh, I love them all. Wow. wow. Whether they are righteous, they pray uh, 20 hours out of the 24, whether they are serial fornicators, see, I love them all. Oh, the greatest love ever. Amen. Yeah, I said, you and I, even including some pastor, we only love you when you are good. Yeah. True or not true? true? Yeah. But God loves you regardless. Amen. Amen. So take heart. All right, take heart. I'm not saying this sarcastically or I'm just trying to be shady or whatever. No. Take heart. Look, if nobody loves you the way you are, God loves you the way you are. Amen. Amen. Are you there? But just try and change more. <laughs> Number three. Number three. Tell your neighbor, the pastor just had to say that. <laughs> God loves the greatest number of people. I think we just explained it, isn't it? He loves the greatest number of people. You and I, one, two, three, then our love is finished. But God says, eight billion, bring it on. Keep adding. One more billion, one more billion, one more billion. Number four, God gave the greatest gift ever, which was his son. Amen. Look, look those of us who are parents, huh? if you heard that, um, Reverend Yao, Reverend Peter has been arrested, and in order for him to be released, bring one of your children so that we will sacrifice him. You say, Pshia, let him rot to hell. That pastor, I don't even like him. <laughs> I, I knew from the beginning that he was not real. I just, there was something in me, I could feel it, but I just couldn't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you there? Some of you say that even my dog in Ghana are not sacrificing for it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You see? That's that. But those of you who even genuinely love me, I mean, even me as a pastor, I mean, if you tell me I should bring one of my children, hey, I mean, which one should I choose? <laughs> 
Desi, oh, now you rot to hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I so bring my desi, the only one when I get home, she's happy to see me. Daddy, daddy, daddy. <laughs> uh, no, you want that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> we'll find some homeless person for you. Hey. Are you understanding? But God gave his greatest gift. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send even one of the angels that have fallen or one of the angels. No, he said, my only son, the only thing that I have, precious, the one who brought, for a lack of a better word, confusion in heaven. When God said, I'm going to create a son, then Lucifer had and he wasn't happy. Yeah, he's the one now I want to give for the whole world. It's not the greatest gift ever. Greatest gift ever. Amen. Wow. Are you understanding John 3.16 now? Yeah. Then he also gave us the greatest invitation ever. Yeah. You see, when I was reading this one, I just thought about all of us who do things. When you are doing a party, only a few people you can invite. I always encourage people, when you are doing something, invite everybody, invite the whole church. I'm yet to see somebody who do that. When you are doing something, you have invited the whole church. No, I fight with people all the time. It doesn't work. Yeah, but God, when he was doing his great move, he said, whosoever. Yeah, can you imagine you're doing a party? You put it on Facebook, CNN, ABC, CBN. Everybody, come July 4th. I'm having a party. This is my address. Everybody, come. Whosoever shall come. You will have hot dog, you will have burger, you have chicken, you have soda. Everybody should come. Hey! I mean, I'm yet, even the queen hasn't done that before. <laughs> huh? Even Oprah hasn't done that. Even Bill Gates hasn't done that. Um, Warren Buffett, all these people, nobody. Yeah, with all their money. But God said, whosoever, great invitation, whosoever, regardless, come and I'll give it. Oh, let's clap for God. Oh, is the preacher? No, I'm preaching. God gives us the greatest and simplest method ever. Are you there? He said, this invitation I'm giving you, when you come, there is no bouncer. There is no where is your invitation. You left your invitation. You didn't RSVP. No, no, no. He said, just believe. Yeah, just believe. Simplest method. Just believe. Amen. Amen. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This ensures that even the poor, the rich, educated, uneducated. As for this, everybody can believe, isn't it? You don't need any qualification to believe. You just believe. Amen. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. Number seven, God gives the greatest escape ever. The escape of hell. That whosoever believes should not perish. Greatest escape should not perish. Amen. Are you there? And last but not the least, the greatest opportunity ever, but have what? Everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Are you there? Yeah. Everlasting life. Can you imagine that you win some insurance money and they say everlasting life? I mean, no one has heard of such thing before. Have you? No. But God gives the greatest opportunity to have everlasting life. So ladies and gentlemen, these are eight powerful things you can preach to somebody this week. When you meet somebody, tell them God loves you. The greatest love ever. God wants to show you the greatest love. God wants to give you the greatest invitation. Amen. These are things, all right? So as we're going through, don't just be listening to me. Oh. You should be making your preaching points. Every week you have preaching points, something you can tell somebody. Yeah, sit with somebody, say, I want to tell you about the greatest love ever. Everybody is looking for a love story in this modern day world. Yeah, so you sit with somebody, say, can I tell you a love story? Really? Is it about you? Tell me. Who's a lucky guy? <laughs> then you tell them, one day, I went to this place, and I met this guy, the most handsome guy ever I met. Really? Where? 
I want to meet a handsome guy too. Yeah. Does he have a brother? <laughs> yeah. And he showed me the greatest love ever. Man, even my mother's love could not compare. My father's love could not compare. Oh, my ex-boyfriend's love could not compare. Do you understand? Yeah. Then maybe if you are married, you even make it more spooky. Even my husband's love could not compare. Like, what? You having an affair? <laughs> then you tell them, yes, it's the greatest affair ever. <laughs> wow, tell me more. Yeah. I mean, you think by the time you're done, this person wouldn't give their life to God. They will. Amen. You see, so there are different ways of talking to people. But when you just go and say, please, I want to talk to you about you. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> you see, you have brought your African ways again. Excuse me, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> please, how are you? What are you saying? <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> hey, stand to your feet. Let's close. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah.